I was always a good worker, you know. I walked quickly to the men's room and back again. You know, I was one of these guys that never said, thank God it's Friday. I really always, uh, I mean, I preferred work to study. And I, I was always motivated by by working on products or services that made a contribution to society. Following his service in World War II, Sid returned to UMass to complete his bachelor's degree in physics. After landing a job with the Naval Research Laboratory, he was sent to University of California, Berkeley to get a master's degree, and there he encountered a fervent political scene. And I went to school out there for a year, got involved with a lot of uh, uh, quite liberal organizations because University of California, Berkeley was a fountainhead of provocative, avant-garde, political and moral thinking at that time. In that time, it was the Trotskyites versus the Stalinists. There were the world federalists that died out. These are people who thought to get rid of all the nations. During his time at Berkeley, Sid was offered a summer job at Raytheon Corporation back home in Massachusetts. As a student engineer, he was assigned to work on antenna technology, but when offered a full-time position, he asked for a transfer to the communication division. I made it clear to them that I did not work, want to work on military projects. Uh, I did design an, a radar antenna, uh, which was quite, I got a patent on it, but I said, I don't want to work on that. So I went back to my experience of microwave and uh, I, uh, <coughs> I transferred out of the antenna branch of Raytheon to the communications department. I became a project engineer in something called a portable microwave link, which could, uh, say, be set up at Fenway Park uh, on a tripod with a dish, and then a cable down to another box and connected to the cameras, and so that you could do remotes, fires, burglaries, baseball. And I was a pioneer in electronic news gathering. I built the very first one. I, I built a microwave link between Mass General Hospital and Logan Airport. The key thing was that I was able to combine the audio and the color all together in one. That was a breakthrough. Nobody could do that. And it was very light, very portable. And we sold hundreds of those. It was a big commercial success for Raytheon. For 22 years, Sid worked for Raytheon, rising from engineering manager to general manager, before finally being appointed director of marketing and sales at Raytheon Europe under Carlo Colosi. The decision was made that we were going to set up operations. He wanted me to move. I came home, told Libby, we're moving to, uh, to Europe. She asked me, what are the plans? I had no idea. She cried. But she packed everything up, sold the house, sold the car, took the three kids, two, five, and seven, came to Europe. Six years later, after very successful Raytheon Europe days, where she was sculpting, had friends, kids went to school, had a driver, we had a maid, traveled. I got a, uh, an offer from my original boss to head up the communications division in Norwood, Mass. I agreed to do it. I came home, told Libby we're going home. She cried. In the late 1960s, Sid was offered a leadership position with a small technology company named Scientific Atlanta. At first, he turned the company down, but when he found himself at odds with the militaristic direction at Raytheon, he reconsidered. By that time, it was clear that I wasn't in the mainstream of Raytheon. I told you. By that time, the Hawk missile was booming. They were selling to Saudi Arabia, to the U.S., to Israel, to everybody. And I was in an area that was not very uh, mainstream in the company. 
In 1971, Sid became president, then CEO of Scientific Atlanta. He took the floundering company and turned it into a pioneering cable communications company. It was uh, into too many businesses, and I sold them off. And I uh, developed a uh, three-year plan and uh, used Hewlett Packard as my example of what a great company would be. Okay, high margins, product-oriented, recruit the best people, customer-oriented, community-oriented. Early in his career at Scientific Atlanta, Sid was approached by Chuck Dolan of HBO and later by Dolan's successor, Gerald Levin, to help the nascent cable company broadcast live sporting events across the country. In 1973, in Anaheim, California, they made their first attempt. So we take it out there with a live fight, 10 o'clock in New York, 7 p.m. in Anaheim, the Disneyland Hotel. People are coming in, cocktail party, coming up the stairs to see this live fight. One guy knocks the other guy out in the first two minutes of the first round. But it was a very powerful thing. Two years later, the thriller from Manila. I have the only earth stations that can pick it up, and the rest is history. With Scientific Atlanta reaching new heights, Sid began to infuse his family's generous and progressive spirit into the company by sharing the benefits with both the company's employees and the greater Atlanta community. I got into Atlanta philanthropy right away. When I got there, we were probably giving like a hundred dollars, you know, because it was a small company. We didn't have anything. It wasn't very profitable. It wasn't the interest. I was interested in community. I learned that from Hewlett Packard. I mean, David Packett and Bill Hewlett were great industrial leaders. Hewlett was the scientific guy, and Packett was the guy that went to the trade shows and talked to customers. But, but they had this theory of, of high margins. You know, develop products that you can sell that don't have to be price competitive, that people buy them because it helps them in their business, and they don't, it, it does so much in their business helps them that they're not going to quibble with you on price. So he priced it. But then he used the margins effectively. One of it was community activity, so as a model. So I started to get involved, as I told you, in these various things. And interesting enough, you don't have to give a lot of money. You just got to show up and be active. Philanthropy and community involvement was an integral part of me being a CEO right from the beginning. I thought I had not only obligations to the shareholders, but, but to the community.